Hi, my name is Elaine Holden. Thank you for joining me today here on Education Matters, Channel 96, Nashua, New Hampshire. I appreciate you joining me today, as always, of course. You know, I talk a lot about childhood, childhood development, education, all the way through the teen years into adulthood, going all into those senior years. And one of the things that I have had conversations with professionals about lately has been curiosity. There's a bit of a rumor going around that somehow or other, the curiosity in children is being stifled. I want to first of all say, cannot believe all these rumors that are going around about a lot of things. But I also want to assure you that in fact, there's no conspiracy out there. Nobody is trying to stifle children with respect to curiosity. Being inquisitive, thinking about the world. What is happening, however, is that many times there's not a lot of opportunity in schools for children to be curious. We have a plethora of materials available for instruction. We have teachers that are really pushed, and I mean pushed, to cover a large amount of curriculum in one school year. There are increased demands in schools, whether it's public schools, private schools, and you have high stakes testing. We also have really high stakes curriculum because there's a lot of competition amongst parents to get their kids into the best schools possible. And this includes preschools, kindergartens, elementary, middle, high school, and ultimately, of course, college and then graduate school. The pressure is on. And that means that children have to be very competitive. There's also a push for structured in experience. What do I mean by that? Well, piano lessons, flute lessons, violin lessons, karate lessons, swimming lessons, soccer lessons, hockey lessons, and the list goes on. And we have lessons for just about everything. Children's lives are incredibly structured. This structure, which is fine, don't get me wrong, we have to have structure in our lives, and we certainly want children to have structure in their lives. But this structure can somehow get a little too much. And what happens is children are not really able to be children. Kids cannot be kids. And this is becoming a problem. Because what we really want to see are the children having exposure to a wide variety of opportunities and experiences. Let me give you an example. I happen to enjoy weather. It's a hobby. And people have had the hobby of weather for a long time. And I have some fairly interesting weather instruments, thermometers, Galileo's thermometer, for example. I have one of those. I have one of those um, cloud chambers for uh, storms, to you know, predicting storms. I have a uh, barometer. I have a lot of different pieces of weather equipment. I like to watch the weather. I like to predict the weather. I like to see if my predictions are matching up with some of the professional meteorologists. And I am a member of the weather band, which is the amateur section of the uh, American um, Meteorological Society. And they actually have a really nice publication. It's called WeatherWise. And it comes out every other, every other month. And it provides a lot of information. And I love this magazine. I read it. I look forward to it. And because I'm a member of the Weather Band, I, of course, get invitations to the different activities that the weather um, uh, groups that are in associated with the American Meteorological Society happen to be putting on. I actually got to meet Stacey Abrams 
from the Weather Channel a couple of months ago. It was pretty exciting because I'm, I'm one of the groupies that watches the Weather Channel and thinks that Stacey Abrams is pretty amazing as a meteorologist. I'm also a supporter of the Mount Washington Observatory, and I get windswept. Then I learn all about what's happening right here in New Hampshire on Mount Washington. And my third, of course, is my Observer's Handbook for 2023, and it's from the Royal Astronomical Society in Canada. And so those are the three books that I have that, or the two magazines and books I have, book I have, uh, related to the weather. It's a hobby. And it started out with just questions. And when I was a kid, I asked my dad questions. I was asking questions all the time. My dad never gave me an answer. His favorite response was, let's check. I have to tell you, let's check became so special because daddy and I would go to the library and he would show me the card catalog and we would go through the topic and try to find books on the topic that I asked a question about. And then we would go to those books and we would get the answer. In the meantime, and this is very characteristic, by the way, of people that inquire about things in the old fashioned way, not on the computer, but in the old fashioned way. When you're involved with inquiring about something, what frequently happens is you get sidetracked and you find something else that's interesting and you kind of go off on that tangent for a while and then you bring yourself back to the main or focus question and you keep getting a little more information and then you get off on another tangent. That's not a bad thing. That's really a deep learning experience. We want that because it creates linkages from one topic to another. The creation of linkages and the deeper investigation into one area or another really helps to solidify the information that the child or the adult happens to be looking for and has discovered. Furthermore, when you go into an investigation for something else, you may find a crossover, you may find another linkage. And that's the sort of thing where you can get into a very deep investigation. And interestingly enough, it can really spur other questions. And of course, in my father's case, his answer would be, let's check. We don't see that on the computer. We see surface answers. We see something coming to us very quickly. We get the answer to that specific question. But because of the nature of the way the structure happens to be in the computer search, you get a very superficial search, most certainly, and most frequently, and as a result, it's really not going deep into the topic. So when we do a let's check with our children, whether they're our children in school, whether they're our own children, when we do that let's check, it shouldn't really be on a computer. It should be in a book in many old fashioned ways, including let's go outside and look. If you have the opportunity to go out and look, to really check on what you're looking for, getting an answer, you can certainly look on, you know, uh, on, on the internet to find some potential sources, potential answers. But, you know, when you're looking for, say, why are leaves green? You can get specific answers as to why leaves are green, the chlorophyll, etc. You can search out the word chlorophyll, chloro being green, and like chloroform, chlorophyll, chlor, you know, uh, chlorine, all of those um, combining forms to make the word chlorophyll, and or fill, loving, loving green. So, you know, that's the thing. You're, you're looking at the language, you're looking at the words, you're looking at the words as far as how they're structured. 
there's a lot of information that you can gather. And going off on those little tangents, as I said, would be a very good thing to do when you're helping children investigate. But for those children to be prompted to ask questions, for those children to sort of be curious and look around the world, they have to have time. They have to have time to think about things, to play, to understand that when they ask a question, that's a good thing. And sometimes when parents are distracted or they are very busy themselves, they might either say, go away or ask me later or go talk to your mother or go talk to your father or go ask a sister or brother or whatever. But many times there doesn't appear to be time to answer those questions. And this is important because as I said, the schools are under tremendous pressure to provide a large amount of information to the students. It's not information the students are necessarily asking. It's information that the teachers are told, you have to get this into the students. And we're gonna be testing you and you know, testing the kids about it later on down the line. So we have the high stakes testing. We have the pressure to do well academically so that the kids can get into a better school, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of pressure on the children right now. A lot of pressure on the teachers. And what happens, what falls by the wayside many times is that opportunity to think about something, to ask questions, to be curious. And I don't think that we can rely on the school simply because of the pressures that are there now for the schools to foster the curiosity that many times in generations past was the place where curiosity was fostered. We don't necessarily have, as I said, that opportunity to do this. So what, what does that mean? Well, it means that it's falling back on the parents and really it should be there. Because when little ones ask questions, it's usually to a parent. And so those questions really do need to be answered. And it doesn't really mean that the parents have to have the answers. Uh, uh, you know, as I said, the let's check every time I asked my dad a question was his go-to. Did he know the answer? More likely than not, he did but he wasn't going to just give me the answer and have me go off on my own. He wanted me to understand that the best thing about a question is finding the answer. And finding the answer is the fun part. And finding all of the stuff around the answer is really fun. And that's why we have to give children as many experiences as possible. Now, I, have a, I, I went to a seminar and a meteorologist was giving a talk and she has been in an airplane that flew into the eye of a hurricane 70 times. That might not be on my bucket list or on yours, but think about it, flying into the eye of a hurricane, that is a cool thing, all right, for maybe somebody else. But think about just, our beautiful Mount Washington. And think about all of the great stuff that we can learn just going up that cog railway, learning about the history of the cog railway, learning about all of the weather stuff going on and all of the research and the speed of the wind and the drop in the temperature. There's so much to learn. And those are the experiences that we want our children to have just here in the state of New Hampshire. And th that's where we actually have to have more than one opportunity, by the way. Children are excited about going on a trip with their parents, on a field trip with the school, but there's so much going on that they can only absorb so much. So the important thing is to have a repeat visit. And so going to a museum and then revisiting the museum and then going again, there's always something going on that's new, that's different, that's going to capture their attention. So don't be afraid to revisit places you've been before. And in fact, you can do it several times. That's why we have museum memberships. And by the way, 
if you don't want to buy a membership in all these different museums, the public libraries buy those memberships. You can reserve tickets through your library. It doesn't cost you anything. And you can get those tickets and go to a lot of museums all around New England because there is reciprocity between um, one museum and another or amongst a group of museums. Those are the sorts of things I'm talking about. Yeah, you would have to pay to, you know, to drive down and probably pay for parking in many instances, but you don't have to pay the cost of the ticket because you can get it free from the museum. Just make sure you make the reservation. Bottom line, those are the experiences that children really should have that will allow them to ask questions. And now we get to the point of gifts. You know, a grandmother calls up, an aunt or an uncle calls up, what are we going to give your child for Christmas, for birthdays, for Hanukkah, whatever? What do we give for a gift? It seems that aunts and uncles, grandparents, caregivers, all kinds of relatives are often saying, what can I give? What's the newest toy? What's the biggest and the brightest? I think what we need to do, rather than say, get X, Y, Z, here's another toy that, you know, is going to fall by the wayside after the child gets bored with it, give an experience. Now, my brother-in-law is a perfect example of doing this. My daughter was given baseball tickets. She was given a violin concert. Um, she was given experiences. And those experiences were what she played the violin as a kid, by the way, which is why she got a violin concert. And she also played, the, uh, played on the local softball team. So she got a, a baseball um, uh, uh, ticket for herself and her best friend, Monica. So those are the sorts of things where you're creative and giving an experience to a child. Or you set aside a day and have that experience, one experience or another with a child. Let the child explore the world. Find something that will be of interest to the child and give that child the day of exploration or the afternoon of exploration. Let them experience something that they would ordinarily not experience. And that is a way to foster that investigative belief and that sense of curiosity. We don't have um, a, a enough exposure in many instances because, as I said, the children's lives are so structured and there's so much going on in a family that many times those experiences fall by the wayside. And it's the experiences that are absolutely essential. When a child asks a question, don't have a ready-made answer. Do a let's check and go beyond the computer. When a child asks a question, help that child formulate exactly what they want to know about the topic that they want to investigate. Give them the time to investigate Give them the exposure and the different places to investigate. This means spending a lot of time with your child. You should anyway, if you're parents and grandparents and you know, you're within a family structure. We have a lot of experiences coming up. You know, spring is coming eventually to New Hampshire and we ski and we snowshoe and we ice fish and we do a lot of winter things. But when spring rolls around, we have rock swaps. The Gilsom Rock Swap is a perfect example of a great place to go. You know, you park in the field and there are all of these rock hounds all over the place. And they have little field trips to mines and they have explorations as far as looking for garnets or mica or whatever. There are activities for children. There's something going on all day long for that weekend. So Saturday and Sunday, there's always activities going on. It really doesn't cost very much money, but you may walk away with 
rocks of one kind or another, and they are very modestly priced in many you know, in, in many instances. And it may foster an interest in rocks. So is it an igneous rock? Is it a metamorphic rock? Is it a sedimentary rock? What kind of rock is it? What is the difference among all these rocks? Where do you find these rocks? What does this rock contain? We're called the granite state. What do you have to have in granite to make it granite? Those are the kinds of questions that children should be asking. And those are the kind of investigative answers that can be found at a rock swap. It can be found in any number of places. I have to say one of the most fun activities for me on that weekend is to go to Gilsom, run into old friends, and really have a good, fun Saturday or Sunday. And that's important. I can remember many, many years ago, I was in the Yucatan Peninsula with my mom. We were walking in the jungle and uh, I had, a, you know, I had hired a guide and we were kind of tramping through the Yucatan. And I ran into this guy with about 20 people with him and he was, his name was Bud Allison. And he was leading a group for National Geographic. And he had, I think, about 15 or 20 mines, opal mines, fire opal mines in, in, in Mexico. And he was leading this group for National Geographic. We got to talking for a bit. You know, you run into somebody in the jungle, you have a conversation. <laughs> and so we said goodbye. And I headed off in one direction and budded, and his group headed off in another. I want to say about 10 years later, I'm walking down the aisle between the two rows of, of vendors, and who do I come across but Bud Allison. He has now retired to upstate New York, and he had started going to the different rocks, walk, rock swaps around New England. And I ran into him. We had a great time talking and, you know, catching up with each other. And what have you been doing since we ran into each other, at, you know, in the Yucatan Peninsula all those years ago? You never know who you're going to meet, right? So those are the kinds of fun things that happen. But those, those kids can learn so much at something like a rock swap. And we have a beautiful, beautiful state where so much is going on. We have parks, national parks. We have state parks. We have Odeon State Park, which has so much to offer. And all of these parks are going to be open and active spring, summer, fall. This gives us an opportunity to spend time with children and to really start doing some great stuff as far as exposure, experience, and answering questions. My point here today is, first of all, when they are young, one of the most really, the most impressive things that can happen is that they have time to be kids. They have time to explore. They have time, and obviously we're watching them. We don't let them just run loose in the woods. But they are exploring and investigating and finding out what's going on in their world. They ask questions because they want to know what's going on in their world. These questions are the...